Okay, hello. Uh, welcome to the second session on poster spotlights. I'm Taposh. I work at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, so if you, I, I hope you know what this is. It's, so we give two minutes uh, to each speaker to invite you to their work. Um, Alex Boyd, super cool, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, hi everyone. It seems like I have a lot more time than uh, expected. Uh, today I'll be talking on our work titled Inference Remark Censored Temporal Point Processes. Uh, marked temporal point processes are a class of models used for modeling uh, sequences of continuous time events. Uh, here's just a brief visualization of one with uh, the different colors indicating different types of marks. These models are used for predicting not only what type of event will occur next in a sequence, but also when. Um, and these can represent various different things, such as logging into a device, purchasing different items, different medical events occurring, et cetera. Particular challenges occur, though, during inference time if uh, portions of the sequence are missing or censored. Um, these models naturally are autoregressive. And so uh, handling missing information like this is particularly challenging, namely because of the fact that due to the continuous time nature, there's actually an infinite amount of different possible completions that could fill in the gap, so to speak here, even if there's a finite amount of different event types that could occur. What our work proposes and derives is the uh, a, a way of marginalizing out um, uh, these, this, this portion of, of the sequence for a variety of different scenarios, such as mixtures of different intervals, uh, some or all of the, the event types uh, being censored or not. And then furthermore, this is done uh, in a model agnostic fashion. So it's applicable towards any marked and point process, so long as it has a well-defined intensity function and it's purely leveraging just important sampling and sampled sequences from the original model uh, being marginalized. If you'd like to learn more about how we actually do this, uh, please feel free to come by our poster uh, 186 later today. Thank you for your time. Yeah, so the next is next poster is on testing conventional wisdom off the cloud. So label aggregation is a crowdsourcing setting where uh, workers are presented with some object like an image or a piece of text, and they're asked to select the correct label from some finite set. So you might imagine that we can show people a bunch of pictures of birds and ask them, is this bird a duck or a blue bird? And in order to try to recover the true labels as accurately as possible, we'll ask multiple people. Uh, we'll get different answers and we'll try to combine their answers into a predicted label. Um, for this task, there's a powerful baseline, which is just taking the majority vote of the workers uh, that the labels they provide. But since uh, people have started to do this in practice, they've proposed many, many algorithms to try to outperform the majority vote. And the way these algorithms generally work is by assuming some underlying model about how workers make errors in labeling and then leveraging that model in a clever way uh, to have a more sophisticated algorithm. The error models uh, that underlie these algorithms generally come from one of these two families, uh, which describe the probability that a worker will respond correctly and sort of uh, delineate what goes into that probability. And different models imply different assumptions about the way that workers make mistakes. Often these assumptions are mutually exclusive. Um, and in the literature, people have generally skipped the step of testing whether or not these underlying assumptions are plausible or implausible. Instead, they just test the performance of their algorithm uh, and then they call it a day. But we think that understanding which assumptions about how workers make errors are more or less plausible can be important. Uh, not just for designing and evaluating these algorithms, but also for things like uncertainty uh, quantification that happen downstream from label aggregation. 
So our paper is about uh, using real crowdsourcing data sets to test uh, various assumptions that are implied by these error models and uh, seeing what we find are plausible, more plausible or less plausible assumptions. So if you'd like to learn more about what assumptions uh, we investigate, what data sets we use and how we do it, uh, please come stop by my poster. Thanks. Okay, the third poster is on validation of composite systems by discrepancy propagation. So, hi, good afternoon. I'll be briefly introducing our work, um, the validation of composite systems by discrepancy propagation. This work was done at the Bosch Center for AI. So imagine you're tasked with creating a complex real world system, such as a car, and you wanna make sure that this car uh, adheres to some uh, specific requirements. For example, uh, making sure that this car that you've built now uh, has a CO2 emissions which are below some legal threshold. However, building this entire system for just for testing is often infeasible. So an alternative approach is to simulate this entire system and then test the compliance with the given requirements. The challenge lies in ensuring that the simulation closely resembles the real world system, even though we lack the precise knowledge of the entire real system dynamics. This is a common scenario for complex systems where we might have information about the individual components, but we do not have end-to-end uh, -end measurements of the entire system because it is often not built or just unavailable. Our work addresses this very issue. We present a novel solution to quantify the disparity between the real world and the simulations, even when the system is comprised of multiple components and we only have isolated measurements of each of these different components. For the running example, consider, for instance, like the for the car that you have different teams of engineers uh, testing different parts of a car with real world tests, and you do not you have to build the entire car before you can you know measure this quantity that you are interested in. Another example where the multi component aspect of our work becomes relevant is in cases of medical studies where there are multiple independent studies, and you want to um, um, try to. Uh, understand how the different mechanisms of, of a biological system would work. In such cases, our approach can then quantify how the concatenation of these different independent studies uh, differs from the actual organisms. So in this work, I, um, in this two minute spotlight, I've just briefly introduced the problem and uh, I would like to discuss the details with you at the poster session later today. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay. The of the last one um, on investigating a generalization of probabilistic material implications and Bayesian conditions. I think maybe that should be uh, beginnings of an investigation. Anyway, um, so well, some time ago, um, when Mukai Dono and Kranovich introduced a family of generalized implication operators, that's that A gamma B, um, in the context, uh, so that's a real parameter gamma, real number, uh, and in the context of probabilistic inference. So they computed the probability of this implication, like so. Um, and the main point for them really was that conditional probability and material implication were both special cases of this generalized implication. So what we've done is generalize that to a relation between the probability of any two of these implications. And the bulk of our paper then is uh, an exercise in computing bounds for various probabilities that are on the table um, in a pretty straightforward way, just taking advantage of the fact that uh, the hypersurfaces you get from such an equation um, are monotonic. Okay, so our probabilities are all imprecise. That notation for the lower and upper bounds of the probabilities includes restriction, clipping, to the interval zero, one. We are able to get bounds for modus ponens using one of these generalized implications and of course, gamma equals zero, gamma equals one, reduces to the standard classical case. 
then we were able to extend this to arbitrary implication chains, so a generalization of modus ponens. Uh, and maybe a last comment. These last couple formulas look kind of horrible, but in fact, they're unreasonably optimistic in the following sense. They're computed recursively. So if there was any of this clipping restriction to the interval zero one along the way, uh, then they're unreasonably uncomplicated. So maybe it's, maybe it's better to stay unreasonably optimistic and stick with these. Anyway, thank you. Okay, one final announcement is that all the people who presented their posters in person, their poster session is actually today after the break and people who presented, uh, did not present their poster online, their poster session is tomorrow, okay? And so we don't have any more people joining us. So have a nice coffee break. Thank you.